So I was in bed asleep and I woke up because my pager was going and it just said, car crash in Paris, Dodi dead, die injured in hospital. This is not a joke. And I heard it uh, just coming back into our bedroom on the radio. And I went downstairs, switched on the television along with the nation and was just transfixed. I was in this, in this room, I remember it vividly. I'd say when she died that uh, everyone felt something. I was asleep in bed and um, one of my editors rang me up and said, Diana's been in a car crash. A lot of people felt that, that when she died, that a light was extinguished, um, a, a particular kind of light, which um, we've never had before and we actually haven't had since. At the moment that she was killed, I think the British press, the media, were filled with a sense of both shame and regret and horror because they felt, is it what we have done that has led to this? I went into the office via Buckingham Palace and people, and it wasn't even light yet, and people were already gathering at Buckingham Palace, this big silent crowd. And Mary, my wife, being very sensible, said, now, don't go over the top, Geoffrey. Be very calm and very quiet and very dignified in every interview you do. So I said, fine, good advice. And then she watched Tony Blair on television, first thing in the morning. And she looked at me just as I was leaving and said, it's impossible to go over the top, Geoffrey. <laughs> so <laughs> I realized Tony Blair had changed the rules when he called her the people's princess. And they regarded her as one of the people. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories. about the people's princess which has just become one of those phrases that with which you know the whole thing has become identified and I have no recollection of the discussion about that at all the only mention in my diary is we agreed it was okay to call her the people's princess well Tony Blair's um, speech up in his constituency when he heard the news about Diana was absolutely excellent I mean he was the one who produced the phrase the people's princess which completely described how people felt about her. And these kind of expressions have a resonance where they really uh, strike the truth, strike a chord in people. Initially, there was a, a lot of hostility towards the media, in particular, the, the press, the tabloid press, were being blamed for being uh, p the reason, part of the reason why she was dead, um, because we bought the photographs and the photographers pursued her I think there were parts of the press that probably did feel um, a sense of guilt, possibly a sense of responsibility for what had happened. Yes, well, I think it was immediately seen as shameful, the way the paparazzi actually hounded her to her death, didn't they? And um, Diana's brother, Charles Spencer, um, called her the most hunted woman in the world. There is no doubt that she was looking for a new direction in her life at this time. She talked endlessly of getting away from England, mainly because of the treatment that she received at the hands of the newspapers. I don't think she ever understood why her genuinely good intentions were sneered at by the media, why there appeared to be a permanent quest on their behalf to bring her down. It is a point to remember that of all the ironies about Diana, 
perhaps the greatest was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. In fact, I think it was grief, not anger. I mean, if you were to say which of it, I don't think there was a, a huge anger, but there was a lot of grief. Um, and the extent of it was beyond what people had imagined. Now, how much of it was vicarious? How much was the genuine grief that you feel if your own mother died or your own sister died? I mean, that's another matter. In other words, it, it could have become, and some people saw it as a form of hysteria. The public reaction towards the, the Queen was, was quite uncharacteristic. And in fact, at times, it was absolutely chilling um, in those initial days. I've always thought that was a bit unfair. The problem with monarchy is there are rules. And the rules are so set down in stone uh, that those even at the very top, even Her Majesty, obeys them. So you can't have the flag at half-mast for someone who isn't royal. Now, we now think now, how stupid. Got that wrong, didn't you? Of course we do. And it's easy to do that sort of being clever in hindsight. The absence of a flag at half-mast at Buckingham Palace upset many people, and the absence of the royal family, who've remained at Balmoral throughout, has dismayed others. What one needs to remember is that this was a family. Um, the, her, Diana's sons were up at Balmoral. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were at that point just thinking of the boys, and they had lost their mother, and their focus was on that. And William said at one point in this interview, he, he said that um, when they'd been up in Balmoral, and we were conscious of this in London, they were definitely being protected from knowing what was happening in London in terms of the public reaction. Now, they must have, they'd have known it was like a, a massive deal, but he said he was genuinely shocked when he came down and saw these millions of flowers and tens of thousands of people out on the street. By the point that she'd got back to London from Scotland and actually seen the capital in mourning, you know, you couldn't help but be moved by that. And as a queen who has always been so in touch with her subjects, I think she was able to recognise that the palace did need to acknowledge that there had been mistakes made with Diana. He, the queen felt that they should learn from Diana and that they should be more human with people, more in touch with people than they had been. The nation needed to feel, this is what Diana was sublimely good at, uh, the nation needed to feel that the royal family truly understood uh, the difficulties, economic, social, uh, that they were going through. It has changed, it has modernised, and it's had to do that in order to keep up with the public, and in, in order to stay relevant. I think also in order to justify its existence. And how much of that is Diana? Some of it, not all of it, but certainly some of it. Diana was almost not of the royal family. I think she was herself. She had a kind of uh, something that rose above all that. Um, it was peculiar to her. I'm not even sure people felt, oh, this is a member of the royal family. Diana became, if you like, something bigger, and that was remarkable but it was in some ways a problem for the royal family because there was something there that was bigger than them at least in terms of the public gaze. No one had ever seen anything like it. Um, you have to remember that you know Diana was an absolute icon in the 80s and 90s. I remember as a little girl watching the royal wedding and being completely bewitched by her. She was the ultimate princess and she was just this constant presence in the media Many men uh, in politically would say, you know, she had to speak and I fall on my knees and do as I'm told. She had this unbelievable gift, uh, that very beautiful, uh, and she was very clever at that as well. Clever women have, where they can make men do as they're told. And she knew she had it. I mean, she was capricious in that sense. And she knew she only had to ask for something and it would happen. Uh, but on balance, I felt she used it for the good. I think her charity work was remarkable. I have it on very good authority that the quest for perfection our society demands can leave the individual gasping for breath at every turn. This pressure inevitably extends into the way 
we look. Eating disorders, whether it be anorexia or bulimia, show how an individual can turn the nourishment of the body into a painful attack on themselves. And they have, at their core, a far deeper problem than mere vanity. She was a really interesting, very complex, uh, very bright woman, a much stronger woman, a, a woman who talked openly about things like eating disorders and, and mental illness. And, and in a way, that also is an incredibly important part of her legacy. She both stood for a change in the way that we might be in public and what we might talk about, but she also facilitated that change. She was not educated, but she was very clever. And she definitely had a really, I think, a quite a deep, intense emotional intelligence. I think she worked people out very quickly and she worked situations out quite quickly. Um, so I think that sense of her, the, the, the world wanting to look at her and say, you have the perfect life, you are the perfect fairy tale princess, this is just wonderful. And actually her knowing, mm, well, a lot, of, a lot of the time it's not. And actually I've got my own difficulties. And I think she did have an understanding of people's uh, inner feelings and, and, and inner torment. I think she had quite a lot of that herself. And she had a peculiarly intense empathy for people who were afflicted or suffering. I think it probably came from her own sense of her own suffering. Um, and she was in some way drawn to people's suffering to do something about it. But that was a deeply personal thing. The age of homeless youngsters is coming down. Children as young as 11 have called on Centrepoint this year. Some have been running from physical and emotional violence, some from sexual abuse. Somehow she found a way of truly understanding how they felt and it, that's not something you can manufacture, it's, it's just something you have and she had it. That particular gene was obviously passed on to William and Harry because whether it's their work with um, veterans, whether it's their work with homeless people, AIDS victims, they do have the most remarkable ability to identify with people that they would otherwise have nothing in common with at all. Um, and there's nothing fake about that. You can't engineer that. It, it is genuine. I think it very much comes from their mother and I think it very much comes from the fact that they were exposed to so much of their mother's work. I feel very closely linked to Sense Points. It is a charity with which both my mother and father became passionately involved. Indeed, it was while my mother was patron that Harry and I had our first contact with Sense Points. I was much younger, better looking and more naive back then. <laughs> I thought I'd get a little giggle. <laughs> but it began to open my eyes to the world so many young London people face. Our visits with our mother ignited a deep and growing interest for the great work the charity does for the homeless. That example of selfless service that Centrepoint represents has stayed with me, and that is why it was the first charity that I wanted to be associated with. Since becoming patron, I've been privileged to witness at first hand, and with the utmost admiration, the great work of its volunteers. But I've seen something else too, the extraordinary courage of so many of Centrepoint's young people in rising to meet such seemingly insurmountable challenges in their lives. I count myself enormously privileged to be associated with such individuals and with such an organisation as this. She was happy to take her sons, for example, into homeless shelters and expose them to issues she really cared about. Um, opened their eyes at a young age. I think she showed them that they had a unique position which enabled them to raise awareness of, of situations like that, but also to, to bring comfort to people and to, to be seen to be doing something positive to improve their situations. And that's something that they've obviously carried forward and is very much part of their work today. She was a, a complex young woman in many ways. Um, she could be very amusing and entertaining company privately away from the cameras, um, but she constantly felt herself under extreme pressure um, from within the royal family, from within the wider public, um, and of course from the media. 
Um, she found it very difficult to try and balance all these various aspects of her life to allow herself some sort of privacy and to fulfill the obligations she felt she had. She had a very close relationship with the editors of the tabloid papers. She would see them, she would talk to them, she wanted them on her side, naturally. She was very shrewd in the way that she spoke to them, she was very open to them, and those that she felt were on her side, she was very, very helpful to. Diana um, sometimes got a lot more than she bargained for when she tried to steer press. Uh, she was phenomenally gifted at doing it, but the thing about press and about press narratives is the idea of control as an illusion. Um, and it's maybe that awful cliche about, you know, if you try to ride the tug, you end up in its belly. But uh, there's no doubt that she was a very active participant in what happened. So it was bound to end bad. She was so popular, she was such a magnet, that her photographs just sold papers, and that's the secret, really, of why she was the most hunted woman in the world. I think she developed a relationship with the public and a relationship with the media, which was a bit different, which was complicated, and which along the way, I think, got her into some difficult places psychologically. And then I think if you throw into that mix what was then became the, the disintegration of the marriage and the sense of people taking sides, I think it became quite difficult for her. There had been this idea that Prince Charles was an older man who had cynically gone out to find a virginal bride who he knew he didn't love, he was in love with somebody else, he was doing this for the monarchy. In fact, I discovered that this was completely untrue in the sense that he was as naive as his young bride and as unprepared for the marriage. It had already been quite well known that she had panicked before the marriage and thought about pulling out, but I discovered that in fact he had done so. Of course, as we know, they went ahead with it, but both with deep misgivings, um, both, both knowing that this was quite possibly unlikely to work. However, he did also try at the beginning, he tried very hard to make it work, and they probably had about two decent years of marriage. Well, I mean, Prince Charles reacted to the news of Diana's death with actually a tremendous compassion towards his sons. He certainly put the children first. And that showed all the way through and the way he behaved going to Paris to fetch Diana's body. It wasn't a question of her being carted back by undertakers. It was personal. He went to collect the body. And he showed enormous consideration for um, William and Harry at that time. It was very moving. It must have been so difficult for them with all those crowds and noise, and throwing flowers and weeping and shouting. But they managed it beautifully. It was Harry who said that how he had um, suffered years of um, mental health problems which stemmed from the loss of his mother, that experience of losing his mother at the age of 12, of having to walk behind her funeral cortege and um, coming to terms with her grief, which he said had taken him essentially the best part of, of 20 years to do, that he'd spent two decades burying his head in the sand. I think she represented a kind of womanhood. I suspect that she had a much greater influence on women than she did on men. I think the difficulties that she had in her marriage, though in some ways exotic because of who she was married to and the peculiar circumstances of it, but the idea of how a woman who is somehow insecure uh, and maybe um, condescended to uh, and maybe not treated seriously, how that woman asserts herself against obstacles um, and people sneering at her in some way. I think her triumph, if it was a triumph over that, is something which I suspect that many women now still look to and say, that is how a strong woman 
can overcome difficulties put in, the, put in her way by bureaucracies, by an establishment. a wronged woman. I mean, she certainly had a raw deal. Um, no, no woman should have been brought into that kind of public role without the support systems, without the press advice, without some real insight into what to expect. Um, and she was, she was young and she was naive, but she very quickly learned to, uh, give as 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 she got and she was she became the master media manipulator um something which he never achieved uh, the duke of edinburgh tried very hard as you know there were those letters that he wrote to her and he was trying his best to help her with the breakdown of her marriage um and i think in some ways she couldn't be helped I think it had almost gone beyond that because of the way she felt. And to be honest, there were also people who maybe did not have her best interests at heart whom she listened to, um, which was tragic. Um, I mean, she should never have gotten involved with the fires, but, you know, she, she did. Um, and um, I personally tried to warn her not to get involved with them, and, and, and I failed. And in the end, you can't stop someone if they're, or very hard to stop someone if they're on the path to their own destruction. The relationship with Dodie Fired, I don't think anybody except for perhaps Dodie and his family took seriously. It may have been her having fun, it may have been her saying, look, I can, I can get along without you. Um, I, don't, I don't think that it was uh, that much directed against the royal family, though she will have enjoyed the fact that it upset people. And I think Diana probably knew full well that the royal family wouldn't like it. Maybe that was one of the reasons why she did agree to go on that holiday in 97 with the fires, because she had offers to go away with other people. But um, she went with Mohammed and his family. You know, Diana was getting herself into something that had the potential really to, to backfire quite badly for her. and. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that's exactly what happened. I'm not sure that she really had any solutions in her personal life. Um, the, her love for Hasnat Khan, the doctor, a Pakistani doctor, had come to nothing. And Dodi Fayed was obviously a path to nowhere. So I don't think there was much going in her personal life. I think it was more her future, her own future in the way of life she wanted to lead. I think her great hope was to sort of shine a light. I mean, that's what she was, that's all she could do. She was not a legislator, she, she wasn't a politician, uh, although sometimes politicians accused her of acting like one, particularly, for example, over the landmines. In the early days of that landmines campaign, she was accused of meddling in things she had no business meddling in. In fact, she approached the landmine issue very much as a humanitarian. Um, she wanted to draw attention to something that she felt deeply about. She was the real deal in that she went out there and um, put herself, you know, not quite in the firing line, but, you know, she'd walk through landmines, she'd hold hands with lepers, she would comfort people who were dying from AIDS. She put her money where her mouth was, if you like. Um, and nowadays we see all manner of um, celebrities and public figures. Following in her footsteps, you have the likes of Angelina Jolie, George Clooney, David Beckham, even Madonna. Um, who are doing some great charity work and using their elevated status to shine a spotlight on, on things. We have to remember that when Diana did it, she was really breaking the mould, um, certainly stepping into uncharted territories for a member of the royal family. I think Diana was extraordinary. She certainly was classless. She wasn't obsessed with millionaires, as I'm afraid nowadays people seem to think money is the most important thing. And that wasn't Diana at all. She thought humanity 
and people being who they should be was more important. The causes that she allied herself to tended to be unfashionable causes. But look at the progress that's been made on HIV AIDS. Look at the, uh, you know, one of the first things that the Labour government did uh, was further action on landmines. I mean, she, she was ahead of her time on some of those things. She was a very active humanitarian. Um, I don't think the royal family had seen anything quite like that. The treaty that, um, that was signed just before her death has pretty much seen the abolition of landmines and was the cause now that Harry is taking on to make sure that by 2025 there are no more. There is no question that a huge amount has been achieved in the last 20 years. Landmines remain politically toxic weapons in the eyes of people around the world. Vast government stockpiles have been destroyed and production of these weapons by the world's arms producers has all but ceased. So I think this, the scale of her work is, is really only evident now. It's taken this long to just see how remarkable what she actually achieved was. In one of the most remarkable things she did, I think it was in 1987, is that she went to uh, a place where people dying of AIDS were is almost like a hospice, I think. And she didn't, she touched, she clearly physically embraced someone with AIDS at a time when that was thought to be some kind of death sentence if you came anywhere near such a person. I think that was transformative of the whole thing. You have to remember that this was uncharted territory for a member of the royal family to be going into a hospital and holding hands with people suffering from HIV at a time when they were generally shunned by society. And I think you, you can actually trace a thread going right the way back to 1987 when she broke those taboos over AIDS. I and mean, I was there that day when she shook hands with those poor unfortunate young men at the Middlesex Hospital, young men who, who, who subsequently died. But she did that without wearing gloves. Royals in those days wore white gloves, inevitably. But certainly in the respect that um, the lead up to Princess Diana coming was, will she or won't she wear gloves? And she didn't. I mean, I believe she wouldn't, and she's lived up to what I, I believe. She knew the facts. Now, she couldn't do anything about research into AIDS, but she could help in drawing attention to the iniquities of it and, crucially, raise vast sums of money, which she did over the years. What is remarkable is she was cuddling people when the royal family stayed five feet away from you, and all you did is bow and let them pass. She broke all those taboos and cuddled people with AIDS. And I don't exaggerate when I say, I wondered if you could cuddle someone with AIDS because I didn't know, I ain't got a clue. But when I saw her cuddle someone with AIDS, I thought, yes, of course you can cuddle someone with AIDS. Obviously not a problem. HIV does not make people dangerous to know. So you can shake their hands and give them a hug. Heaven knows they need it. And so that ability to bring to people a feeling of simplicity and honesty was incredible, absolutely incredible. And I repeat, I think that uh, with Prince William and Prince Harry, you just see an extension of it, which would have been unacceptable 20 years ago. HIV was a death sentence. Treatment was not widely available in the developed world, let alone in the poorer regions. Stigma kept HIV positive people from talking openly about their condition and kept vulnerable people from having the courage to step into a clinic and ask for a test. But thanks to the work of leaders in the fight against HIV, people like Nelson Mandela, Sir Elton John, Dr. Peter Piot, the brave activists of TAG and ACT UP, and like my mother, Princess Diana, we have made huge progress. William and Harry have had to deal with um, an image of their mother projected in the press of which they have no control over. Um, whether it's ex-lovers selling letters, um, people recalling their experiences of their time with Diana, working with Diana, loving Diana, whatever capacity it's been. And there have been former aides, courtiers and lovers who have cashed in on Diana's memory. William and Harry have had to watch that without having any control. Uh, Harry's spoken quite recently about the fact that 
he has felt conflicted in the past about his position. He's not wanted all the uh, scrutiny. He didn't want to live in the goldfish bowl. But they understand their power and they understand that they have this unique platform um, through which they can spread their message and, you know, in turn be used as weapons of soft diplomacy, if you like. They can um, reach a, f a far wider audience, perhaps, than your average celebrity. Again, I talked to Prince William about this and he said, you know, I said, do you, do you buy this line at all? That she kind of, you know, got herself into a lot of these difficulties because she she tried to play the media game. She, and he said, look, I think his word was shenanigans. He said, I know there were shenanigans went on, but he feels that she was very isolated, uh, very vulnerable, not terribly well protected. Once the marriage started to to go wrong, he actually said, I thought it was it was it was, it was really moving the way that, that he said that. One of the, he felt really sad because he felt that that was the sort of role that he and Harry could have played had they been older. That actually, has, as they became adults, used themselves to this kind of goldfish bowl existence, that they'd have been able to protect her better than she could protect herself. And I think they did feel that they got, that she got used and exploited. Well, I must say, I do think that they have been very forgiving considering their mother was practically driven to her death. And um, I think that the, that the way they behave, the kindness and compassion that they show is pretty remarkable. She was in some ways destructive of the royal family. I don't mean deliberately or directly because I think she was a monarchist, but it was clearly her aim and intention to make sure that the Prince of Wales never became king. And a lot of what she did in terms of her broadcasts and the help she gave with certain journalists and biographers was to try, if she could, to prevent that ever happening. Well, Diana made the statements about Charles's suitability as a king in that you know, infamous panorama interview that she did with Martin Bashir. I think perhaps retrospectively she regretted some of the things that she said in that documentary, not least because they hurt her sons, which was never her intention. She didn't say that she didn't want Prince Charles to be king, she said that she thought that he may not want to be king, which was a very mischievous thing to do. And she was always very clever at uh, sewing these these little points into the, the her public utterances that would be picked up. But that, of all of the ones that she did, was the one with the greatest power of destruction. And um, she saw a, a very different side to Charles to the side that the rest of us see. But I think quite a bit of what she said was probably fueled by anger and bitterness and resentment. And so she knew in talking about the idea that Charles himself might wish to take himself out of the line of succession, that this was dynamite. Um, I don't think that she probably thought it through uh, in terms of what she really wanted because no mother would really want um, for their eldest son to have thrust upon them early the kingship. But I'm sure that she knew it was something that could uh, damage him quite considerably, and it did. He's been fighting that idea ever since, that, that he doesn't really want the top job. It's interesting how Charles has changed. In 1997, he was not a popular figure. He was seen as the man who inexplicably had chosen to distance himself from this uh, immensely beautiful and vulnerable, uh, still young woman. And yet, uh, 20 years later, uh, he has become a figure uh, whose inner uh, quality of his life has a much bigger uh, public acclaim than it ever had, and yet his ideas uh, about uh, nature, the environment, uh, this country, about uh, humanity, uh, are seen to be no longer behind the times, but in many ways ahead of the times. I think Charles's influence on his sons is something that often gets lost and I think a lot of people might think that she was solely responsible for raising William and Harry and and 
grooming them to become the young men that they are. But actually, you have to remember that from the age of 12 and 15, they grew up without a mother. Yeah, well done, brother. Well, thank yous, I think I deserve it. Shut up, I nearly fell off my horse trying to hit you the ball and you missed it, Spoon. <laughs> yeah, right. Spoon, did you say that? Spoon, yeah. It's not a swear word. It isn't, are you sure? Yes. I do Let's not mention the word you invented, Les. No, no, no. No, we won't. No. <laughs> Wait, he invented. He's not. Yeah. He's not. No, Harry, absolutely, yes, absolutely. I um, and the rounded men that they are today is largely down to Charles. I think he's often overlooked as a parent. Charles had to step in and do the job of two parents under the most unimaginably hard scenarios. It wasn't an easy situation. And um, I think sometimes he did deserves more credit than he's actually given. I think the one thing that unified Diana and Charles was how they wanted to raise those boys. Well, of course, Diana was very beautiful. That always helps. And very photogenic, and she knew it, and she knew how to perform for photographers. But this was not a fake. Underneath it, she had very strong feelings and great feelings of friendship and encouraging people to talk to her, to talk about their problems to her. She really was a compassionate person. And I think if you think back through the, the pictures that people remember, I mean, there are millions of pictures of Princess Diana, but there are some pictures, the, the first time that she held the hand of the guy who had HIV AIDS, uh, walking through the minefield, uh, the night that Prince Charles was doing his big television interview and she wore that amazing black dress and just got us off on all the front pages the next day looking like uh, drop dead gorgeous she thought in pictures and I think that that was I don't think it was manipulative I think it was instinctive she knew the power of the picture and she knew the power of the picture to create this sense of an empathetic person which was real you couldn't fake that for people who uh, are new to Diana's story, it's one of endless fascination for them. Um, there's this incredibly beautiful, glamorous woman who lived a remarkable life and had a huge impact on the world. People who are now just reaching their 20s really want to know more about her. They want to hear about her life and her legacy and see what all the fuss was about, really. It's very hard for them to imagine, um, pre the Kardashian era, somebody who was quite that famous in a time before social media. She was, you know, one of the first huge icons of our lifetime. I think uh, Princess Diana's death did make people think, is the royal family a little out of date? The Queen is now much more likely to take tea with nursing staff in the canteen rather than go to the boardroom. Uh, now that is on one level, but clearly there have been other changes too. And I think this has been driven, if you like, from the bottom up, because I think because of Diana's influence and the way she approached um, her role, if you like, the public have demanded that the royal family adjust. But if you're asking me, is the modern royal family very different to the one 20 years ago? Very different. At a time when most institutions have, have almost gone into reputational freefall, whether that's the banks, whether it's parliament, whether it's politicians more generally, whether it's sports stars, the monarchy seems to me to buck the trend. Um, 
But I think a lot of that has been about the way the Queen has adapted. I think there has been a kind of process of adaptation that's gone on. And also I think it's maybe that they got all the really bad stuff happening to them before everybody else. But I think the combination of the Queen, what she called Annas Horribilis, and then the Diana moment, the Diana death and and those that moment during the week when it all felt very, very vulnerable and shaky and then getting through that week and then I think they I think they did kind of adapt after that, just a little bit, not too much, but enough to get themselves into a much better place. William and Harry um, have spearheaded Heads Together, along with Kate, very much in their mother's memory. They've talked a lot recently about their own struggles in coming to terms with the grief uh, of losing her. William has talked about the fact that, you know, he still finds it to be immensely shocking now, even to talk about it 20 years on. Um, but he's really encouraged other people, who, through his work with Child Bereavement UK, for example, to talk all the time and to talk about their lost loved ones as much as they possibly can as a way to overcome that grief. In fact, he's the one who encouraged Prince Harry to go and seek help after you know his life descended into what he describes as total chaos. Um, Harry is someone who didn't talk openly about his mother's death for a very long time. Uh, my sense is that William and Harry, losing their mother at such a young age, always so difficult for young people to do, uh, they were given vulnerabilities that uh, unresolved issues inside their psyches. And at some point, and it traditionally comes out at the age that they now are, uh, they want to try and resolve those. And I think the fact that their mother was such an articulate person uh, that helped them to uh, have the confidence to feel that they could talk in public uh, about the mental, emotional difficulties that they've had. Talking can make us realise that we're not alone. The opposite of talking is isolation and fear. Sometimes getting something off your chest is an important step in coping with the situation. So you know that you're not alone. You're not failing. And it is perfectly normal to feel overwhelmed or sad at times. Everybody does. Uh, William and I have chosen to get involved in those key charities, not as a, so much as a result of, of their mother's untimely death, but because they were issues that she was concerned in. Um, I think the fact that Harry has taken an interest in landmines and, and in particular his other charities in Africa, which would be very close to Diana's heart, um, are just because they are, they are Diana's children. Well, neither of the boys, as open as they've been in the series of interviews that they gave about Heads Together, have, have ever said it was because their mother herself suffered from mental health problems, depression, bulimia, um, all of the things that you know we know Diana did, did suffer from. Um, but I think it doesn't take a psychologist to work out that having gone through so many years of trauma and grief and having to have gone through what they went through so publicly, that a charity or an initiative that is dedicated to mental health and being more open about our problems, um, being able to talk more openly about things like depression, um, would resonate with, with both of the boys. The three of us have learnt a lot in the past few months as we have met people. The conclusion we are coming to is that the more we talk about all of this, the more collectively, as a society, we can do to support one another. The theme of World Mental Health Day this year matches this. It is mental health first aid for all. To us, mental health first aid means getting in there early to support people before what they're going through becomes more serious or even clinical. That support can be as little as a conversation and a listening ear, or it can be signposting someone to a professional service. These actions may seem little, but they are vitally important. 
I, th- I think the mental health stuff's fantastic. Uh, and I, I, I wrote a piece at the time when they first start, said they were getting involved. I said, well, you know, the Republican in me finds this really annoying that they can go into any cause and because of who they are, they get coverage, they get heard, they get access to government, whatever it might be. But the mental health campaign, I mean, was absolutely overjoyed because it makes a difference. There's no point denying it. It makes a difference. But it only really makes a difference if you do it well. Um, And I would say that the Heads Together campaign has been absolutely brilliant. And I think it's definitely moved the dial. Um, Now, would they have got involved in that if somebody else was their mother? I've got no idea, but she was their mother. And I think it is, I do think it's uh, part of her legacy that that's the route they've gone down. And I hope they stay that, down that route for a long time. And um, possibly it took connecting with a charity like Mental Health, Heads Together, um, possibly that's what it took for Harry to be able to, to publicly acknowledge that he'd also had problems. I was told that he felt very strongly that if he was going to spearhead this campaign and encourage others to be open and talk about their own problems, then he knew he'd have to open up and be honest in the process. And he was, and in doing so, he was incredibly brave. William, Catherine and I started this campaign because we saw that fear of judgment, stigma and outdated prejudice meant that too many people stayed quiet about their mental health challenges. And we saw that this fear of even talking about a problem often meant that issues could quickly escalate out of hand. How is it that for most, the first time mental health is talked about is when they're already suffering? Stigma cannot and must not be the reason we shy away from equipping ourselves and our families for the day that a dark cloud may appear. Diana's legacy is is a mixed bag of what people would like it to be and what it actually is. What people would like it to be is about emotional intelligence, is about modernity. What it actually is, is something I think even bigger about a complex woman in the public eye and somebody who was who was so iconic, so famous, that she will always be with us for, for centuries, I think. Well, I think the important thing is that she provided an example of compassion and real compassion, as opposed to people paying lip service to being nice or being charitable. And I think that is an important legacy, and I think that today's politicians fail quite severely on that. On the one hand, you know, she has this uh, hugely glamorous image. She was an icon of fashion, style, very beautiful and graceful. Uh, but I think perhaps her compassion is something that really has has lasted and has stood the test of time. People really remember her having this presence. You know, she walked into a room and she'd light it up, people often say of her. Um, she genuinely brought comfort to people and made them feel special made them feel important when they were perhaps going through incredibly difficult um, experiences. And I think that's something that most people remember her for. Her legacy is twofold, really. Her, Her legacy is her sons, and her legacy is the work that they are now continuing. It was William who made the point that there is now a young generation um, in the world who really don't know Diana. Um, they, They don't know the huge things that she achieved and this amazing legacy that she's left behind. She shone the spotlight on issues that would otherwise have just stayed hidden beneath the carpet and neglected. Diana's legacy has to be the way that she changed the monarchy, away from a austere, rather remote institution into one which was far more personable, seen as far more authentic, Uh, populated by uh, younger royals who could connect uh, with the issues that confronted uh, every man and every woman. And yet they did that without losing the dignity of the office of the royal family. Diana's greatest legacy are her children um, because they have turned out to be remarkably well-adjusted young men and they've turned out to be very much like their mother and I think she is going to be casting the image 
of the House of Windsor into the 21st century. So I think that there has been a fundamental shift. I think we'll have a much more caring, more involved uh, monarchy, not so insular, um, possibly smaller uh, uh, um, and more compact, but more relevant somehow. I, I just feel that the language that the boys speak is, is the language that people recognize every day on the streets of Britain. And I think that will increase its relevance going forward and also ensure I think the long-term security of the monarchy, because frankly, it has to change, it has to adapt uh, to meet changing times and conditions.